seat of the pants, just like a cowboy on a Bronco. <laughs> All right. Welcome, Revolutionary Freedom family. Today, we have a guest that I'm extremely excited about, ma mainly because his chops in the street are much sharper and more refined than mine. And I'm, I'm excited for you guys to hear Dr. Joey today. Dr. Joey is an executive coach, a culture architect, host of the Work Positive podcast. His best-selling book, Work Positive in a Negative World, Team Edition, is the manifesto for developing your positive work culture. He's spoken to thousands of people within companies and associations annually for decades. Dr. Joey is a prolific writer of over a thousand articles that have appeared on the websites of Fox News, CNBC, Wall Street Journal, Market Watch, MSNBC, Entrepreneur.com, and countless others. His content reaches people in more than 50 countries. He and his wife have two adult daughters and sons-in-laws. The most brilliant and beautiful granddaughter ever born, four ever grand dogs, born. <laughs> and enjoy living in Pleasant Gap Farm with their two cats, Horse and Maggie Mae, the Yellow Lab. Absolutely. I have a Yellow Lab, actually a oh, Fox Red go. Lab. But she's close enough to yellow, so we're going to get along phenomenally. Hey, that's awesome. Our yellow well, lab is fox red also. Yeah. Good. Maggie Mae sends See, her. Uh, fox red. Yeah, that's right. There's not too many fox reds out there. Yeah, our Maggie Mae sends her regards to your yellow lab. What's her name or his name? Tris. T-R-I-S. Tris. I love it, man. All right. We'll have to introduce him. Yeah, absolutely. Ours is named after Tris Pryor of the Divergent series. Oh, movies. I so, have no idea other than Maggie Mae's a Southern dog. And so she needed two names and that's what my wife chose. <laughs> <laughs> my wife's dog, <laughs> Bo was mine. <laughs> it's easy. Yeah, that's so, yeah. that's definitely Southern too. That's it, man. That's right. Well, that's what my dad called me. I, I grew up thinking my name was Bo instead of Joey. I'm so excited to be here, man. Any, any podcast that is about revolutionary and freedom, I'm on board, man. So thanks for having me on. I appreciate it. It is my pleasure. I'm super excited to get rolling. Yeah, man. Excuse me. All right, before I have a conniption, one of the things that I'm a little bit excited about, and, and people that listen know that I don't do a whole bunch of scripting and a whole bunch of pre-formatting and different things, and I like to roll with it real casual. And so that's how sometimes we end up on six hour streams, but I will not torture you today. <laughs> <laughs> or else I'll have to get you like a, a protein bar or something to bring your blood sugar up. But, I had a protein shake for lunch, so I'm good. <laughs> oh, we're good. So yeah. one of the things I'm excited about is that in the workplace, professionally, before that we were building this Adam Kasich's and Revolutionary Freedom brand, mm -hmm. was I did small and medium business coaching, very oh, similar to what you did. When I saw your culture architect, I thought to myself, mm -hmm. Oh, I hope this relationship doesn't work out because I want to steal that. <laughs> <laughs> that is so, so funny you say that. I, I was on a podcast yesterday. I did an interview on, there is a podcast called Culture Architects. And the host, my friend David Friedman, asked me, hey, how long have you been a culture architect? And I was like, David, you didn't like trademark culture architects. And I infringed on your trademark, did you? You're not going to send me an invoice after this. <laughs> but it is pretty cool to think of yourself as a culture architect. Yep. That's strong wording. Mm -hmm. I have been done some of these things, worked in some places doing that, really enjoyed getting into the interpersonal communication, interpersonal relationships, conflict resolution, helping people communicate better with their staff, mostly the execs in sure. disseminating information. So they're more approachable and people feel empowered and all those good things. Right. So when I saw that, I have not done it for 30 years plus. And look, I'm selfishly like, yeah, I hope that people can become their more, live in more of their authenticity according to their core mm. value, get more set free and more fulfillment internally through the things that you're going to teach today, especially when it comes yeah. to their job place or right. wherever you want to go. But a big part of this is Adam's excited to get talked to, to learn <laughs> some things. So I'm, well, man, I'm excited that, to talk know? to Adam. I've never talked to Adam Kasich before, so this is a great adventure for me. Yeah, first time. That, that's a mixed bag of opinions if you do a survey. I didn't do a survey. I'm just opening up my heart and being authentic with you, buddy. <laughs> right on, brother. So, yeah, what, how do you, what do you do? What do you, whatever you want to do to start, roll off that intro and just freestyle. I don't have anything in mind personally other than what I've already spoken. Okay. What do you think of when you hear the, my descriptor, culture architect? What pops in your mind, Adam? So I use the word for myself as a culture mover and or a culture shaper. And the thing that comes into my mind is that 
so I, I believe strongly and understand that culture is developed from, yes, it's led top down, but if the base, if the team isn't in alignment, working toward the same thing, then the culture is not going to change it, or, or it's, it's difficult to move that. There's too much friction in the way. And in order for the team to be able to do that, each individual person has to make certain internal decisions themselves. It, it, it's, it's an individual job that goes up the ladder. You, you change a nation by its citizens. You don't change it by its presidents or its leaders mm. in, in terms of leadership philosophy. And so when I hear culture architect, I think of someone who's equipped to come in and work with the variety of personalities and mm. positions up and down the ladder and your skills, your relationship ninja, most likely. And <laughs> So that being said is one of the key factors is what I think about. And yeah, to answer that question for you. Yeah, that's awesome. That's awesome. And I want to pick up on a point you made. Every company or every family or every community, but we specifically work with companies or in organizations, every company and organization has a culture. It falls out one of two ways. It's either an intentional culture or Culture, it's not written down. It's not, there's no conversation around. Here's the way we roll around here. You just roll. And so when you're trying to attract top talent, they learn pretty quickly, hey, we just got to jump in here and roll. It's like jumping in a stream, wherever the stream takes you. However, on the flip side of that, cultures that are intentional, even as a part of the attraction process of top talent, here's who we are. Here's how we roll. Here are the things we do. Here's the way we do it. Those off the resume kind of characteristics. Here's what's important to us. I discovered early on five key characteristics that are off the resume of what I like to call Adam work positive dream teams. We listen actively to each other. We are humble with each other. And it's not that I think less of myself. It's I think less about myself. Right. And, and therein lies the key to humility. Thirdly, we work for mutual benefit. So I believe that when Adam and I both win, there's a greater good served in the company benefit, right? So it's listening actively. That is, you're not listening to wait until somebody takes a breath and then jump in and say what's most important to you. You're listening actively. And then we work through humility and mutual benefit. And then accountability is the fourth key characteristic. Accountability is not me standing over you, making sure that you do it my way. Accountability is our. Dr. Joey, I lost you. I lost you. Wow. What a mess. Mm. Take one. What is that? Is that three on one? Oof. Oh man.
We are still going. I do not have his number. <gasps> Is he back? <laughs> I'm sorry, dude. I'm over here looking for phone numbers and emails. <laughs> let, let me give you one right quick. How about that? <laughs> let me give you yes, a phone please. number right quick in case it happens again. Area code 434-548-5433. That'll get you Thank right you. here to the bat phone, buddy. Thank Man, you. I don't know. I, I was just talking along and went through the five key <laughs> characteristics of author resume, work positive, dream team qualities. I've never been so prolific and, and wonderful. Dialed you in. <laughs> bringing out the best of me in me. And so I was, and I was looking right at the camera and you're over right there, but I wasn't looking at you. I was looking at the camera and things. Yeah. Then I waited for you to say something. You didn't say anything. And you were like, like that. And I was like, oh, dude, his face is frozen. Oh, man. I couldn't even get out. I, I, but my recording was still going, so I don't know. I never stopped on my end because one file is, if you go to multiple files for one show, it creates a tremendous amount, right? I don't know if you know this or not. You've got people doing your things. Uh, but I'm doing all mine right now, and I've learned the hard way. Keep it one file no matter what. I'll just chop out this few minutes. So you were it. saying. Uh, you, I lost you at the moment you were getting ready to expand on accountability. Okay, accountability. All right, let me pick that up then. I see, and that's the four key quality. Okay. Yeah, and I got in front of me, I do have the five on five for interviews. And there was a couple things that I wanted to touch in there about ego crippling best chance of work success. And also the two words that can, what word was it? The turnaround? I don't know. What are the two words? You can just toss it to me. And, and what I'll are pick two it up. words that reverse the polarity of any negative conversation? I like these ideas because a lot of times what you're talking about is people getting their egos in the way and causing those issues. And I truly believe if somebody's getting to be there, they're acting out of their core self, they're not mm -hmm. acting out of, they're acting out of humility. Okay. And a lot of times right. you let the ego get in there. Well, whatever. I don't, but right, you're right. We, yeah, we can talk more about that. Do you want me to go back and pick up with accountability? Would that be cool? That'd be great because my second pillar is called power and my seven pillars of revolutionary freedom. It's called, it's called power. And uh -huh. all that is about, we give up our power by letting go of responsibility. It's all about ownership. It's all about personal ownership. So this will complement very well. Okay. All right. I'll go right back. I'll start over with accountability and that way it gives you a a push point now. So you've heard about listen, you heard about uh, humility, you heard about mutual benefit. So now I'm going to pick up with accountability, right? Okay. Yes. All right. And so Adam, the fourth key quality that these are off the resume, buddy, but these are intentional culture pieces that in order to have work positive dream teams, you must have. So the fourth one is accountability. Now, look, man, I know so often we think the manager's got to stand over us or be constantly asking us and micromanaging. And that's how we're held accountable. But that's not the way work positive dream teams work. Work positive dream teams, Adam, use accountability to think about it this way. Adam is putting just enough pressure on me to bring out the best in me. Because growth always lies beyond the edge of my comfort zone. And we all know that we like to stay in that familiar space, right? Because it's nice and cozy and our ego doesn't want us to march off the mental map, right? Try something new because we might get eaten by a tiger or a lion, right? <laughs> because it's our caveman brain or what I like to call the caveman brain, cavewoman brain, caveman brain. So accountability is when we put enough pressure on each other, just enough pressure uh, to bring out the best in each other. Think about it as a rubber band. I could put a rubber band around a deck of cards or something, holds it in place, stack of papers, whatever. But if I stretch that rubber band too hard, it's going to break. I don't want to break you. You don't want to break me. We want to succeed. So we're putting just enough pressure on each other to say, hey, come on, Joey. What, what about this? And you keep asking those powerful questions to bring out new awareness in me. So that's we listen actively. We're humble. We work for mutual benefit and we're accountable. So the fifth key quality I found is one that's very easy to dismiss. Uh, because of its familiarity, and yet it's the essential glue that holds the previous four together. And that's the golden rule. Um, I really want to put your needs up front. And I, I want to make sure that my needs are getting met also because it's mutuality. We're back to mutual wins, right? Uh, that mutual benefit. However, man, I've, I've got to be good to you. And, and that means I've got to move beyond my reactions to formulate best responses, right? And there's mm -hmm. a gap between those 
uh, between the reaction and the response. And that's where I want the golden rule to really reign in our relationships. So that's the way work positive dream teams roll. And that's a stated intentionality of culture. It's not necessarily our natural reaction to anything, but these are responses that we can give to the work that creates places fun. And I wake up in the morning wanting to go to work because Adam, I'm spending 70% of my waking hours working, right? At least 70%. I want to have fun and I want to be fulfilled and find meaning and satisfaction. There's a handful of things to unpack there. So one, one thing that I want to touch on, and this relates to the ego piece mm -hmm. in terms of the, how the accountability comes in, mainly trying to achieve the golden rule, the space between the stimulus and the response is that gap where we get choice. And most of us are living at a subconscious level of automated responses. Yes. Automated from, reactions, right? Automated reactions. Like for, mm -hmm. Yep. Because of our conditioning, right? And that's what's mm -hmm. conditioned. It's usually the ego mm -hmm. even driving. Every I believe a lot of people are unhappy, experience dissatisfaction and friction in their relationships that would otherwise be maybe brighter or more peaceful and more, I don't even know, just cohesive. Mm. So what, how do we help the person who doesn't even necessarily like that they always react negatively or often react negatively per that stimulation in like response to the other person who maybe is just one of those cantankerous types, but they keep going in that way, but that's not really who they are. And mm. that even to have to stay in their ground or to keep their workplace street cred, whatever the thing is, but then they, they're not like that with people that love and that they care about and at home. How do we get in there for that person to not get walked all over, to be able mm. to hold their ground? Their voice can still get heard, their contribution still made, sure. but they're not responding in that or reacting in that like kind. What, how do we get in there and start, you know, overhauling that? Oh man, what a great question. Coaching. Our company has an ICF, International Coaching Federation Certified Training Program. There are eight core competencies that ICF drives you towards. One of those is evoking new awareness. Okay. So I've never met anyone. <laughs> maybe I will tomorrow, but Adam, I've never met anyone, or you may be the first who, let's say I observed, I like your word cantankerous. So let's say I observe you being cantankerous. I've never met anyone who was less cantankerous by me saying, come on, Adam, don't be so cantankerous. You know, <laughs> right. But yet that's our reaction to cantankerous people, right. Or mean girls or however you want to talk about it. That's because when I tell you, Adam, you got to go do this or what's wrong to you do this, your prefrontal cortex, and I'm not going to geek out on neuroscience. So just, but just let me tag a base here, your I'm prefrontal fine. cortex. And as you can see, I have a highly developed prefrontal cortex here, <laughs> <laughs> right? Pushed all Mine's my hair growing. out, man. Mine's okay. growing. Yeah, that's right. My prefrontal cortex is getting larger every day. <laughs> I'm going to look like Herman Munster before long, right? With that shell part. <laughs> Careful on these references, Dr. Joey. We got a younger audience. Oh, that's right, man. Okay, go to TV Land or go to YouTube. It, it was hilarious. But anyway, yeah. <laughs> it was black and white TV. It's pretty cool. My prefrontal cortex turns into Kevlar or Teflon every time you tell me what I ought to do or what I need to do. And I'm using a finger point here if you're not listening, if you're not watching. Because that's what it is, man. You got a finger in my face and Adam, don't be so cantankerous. Okay. Instead, taking a coach approach helps evoke new awareness. Now, how do you do that? Asking powerful questions. Adam, I, I can't help but observe, or I notice that you're, you're a little different today. What's going on with you? And so you hear that nudge towards awareness. Gary Ridge is a new friend of mine. Gary retired as the CEO and chairman of WD-40. Everybody's got a can of WD-40 around the house, right? Whether yeah. it's a little can or a big bucket. So Gary tells a story about going into a meeting one morning. And this was when we all used to go into the office, right? And so they're sitting around the table and this one dude is just acting out. He is like all over the place. 
nothing's right for him. He's raining on everybody's parade. It's just not a, not fun to be with him. And of course, like, you know what that does to the whole meeting. So pretty soon they get out of the room and Gary says, let's say the guy's name is Joey. Gary says, Hey, Joey, you got a minute? And he says, yeah, man. come on, let's go down the street and get a cup of coffee. So Gary goes over to his car and he starts looking around the car and the guy says, what are you doing, Gary? He says, I'm looking for somebody. And Gary gets down, looks under the car, opens the trunk, is looking in the trunk. And the guy says, Gary, what are you doing, man? Who are you looking for? And he says, hey, I'm looking for my friend Joey. Because I didn't recognize that guy masquerading as Joey in that room in there. But I know the real Joey is here somewhere. You see what that does, man? That just sets it off in a different direction. So then the guy could talk about, man, and I don't remember the particulars, the dog peed on my favorite pair of shoes this morning on my way out the door, or my kid threw up on me, or something happened on the way out the door. He was just not at the top of his game. So that conversation led to some transformation, and Gary could work with him with some more powerful questions. So Joey goes back and apologizes to everybody in the room. Hey, I'm sorry I wasn't at my best today. I was just having an off day. So that's how we do it. We don't, our reaction, Adam, is to point a finger and make Kevlar out of somebody's prefrontal cortex to where they defend their turf. And that's an egotistical response, right? That's the reaction. Yeah. Because I'm going to protect myself. And that's the job of the ego. But to ask a question, hey, what's going on? You seem a little off today. What's what's happening? Just to help evoke that new awareness and let me claim, hey, Adam really cares about me. And that's why he's asking me that question. So then authentic, transparent conversations could take place. Adam, we're keeping it real, man. Yeah. You know, <clears throat> what in terms of these are powerful things because one of the things in my training is to help people raise their awareness. It's like mm -hmm. the first step of, of life awareness. Mm -hmm. What are the benefits? What are, are there immediate are the long-term benefits? What do the benefits look like to the person who's taking your advice to reach that person who's difficult? What do yeah. they, instead of just reacting and holding their ego ground, if they right. take a softer approach often in the moment feels weaker. It feels like you're going to get stepped on or abused or mistreated. If they're able to do this, what kind of effects come out of that for them personally first? And then obviously it'll ripple through the workplace. Let me recast a word you just used, and that is advice. Advice tends to get dismissed very quickly. It's what? E Distance? Yeah, advice gets dismissed pretty quickly. Okay. Yeah, dismissed. And because that comes from a superior, inferior position, even if you are, let's say, more emotionally developed or have more emotional intelligence than the person you're talking with to say, for instance, <laughs> Hey, Adam, can I give you some feedback? That, that creates an allergic reaction for most of us. Cause that word feedback, that means I screwed something up and you're about to tell me how to do it. Right. Give me advice. But what if instead of advice, I regard you as the expert in you. And I believe in you so strongly and who you are and the uniqueness of you. And we belong together. And I believe that because we're working together, right? What if I just want to call out the best in you? And so I can make some observations. Um, how are you doing today, man? You know, and ask that question. You just seem like something was bothering you. And then that opens up the door to you discovering, because I believe with the answers are within you, or you have the ability to discover your own sources of answers and to go get those outside of yourself. So I, rather than advise, I just want to ask those questions that open you up. I'm convinced that learning is better behavior. Learning is better behavior because it's got to result in some different actions. If I truly learned it. If I didn't, it was just an intellectual assent to uh, a statement. Even if it's a statement of conduct, here's the way we're yeah. going to roll it in here. Okay. I agree with that, but my behavior is totally different. Boom. It's just something besides that. One of my mantras, my personal mantras is I don't have to say 
everything I'm thinking. And frankly, that was one of the best days of my life, Adam, when I discovered I didn't have to say everything I was thinking. I've been married to the same dear woman. Her name should be Grace for 40 years, right? And early on, I discovered I didn't have to say everything I was thinking because that kept me from reacting and helped me respond. So if I'm communicating, I want to think about how she's going to hear it best, whatever it is I have to share, what's going to help her awareness rise, what's going to help her choose a new set of actions, right? And then align that awareness with those chosen actions and then set up her own accountability system, right? For making sure that she does it. If I get invited into the accountability equation, that's fine. If I don't, that's fine too. It sounds as though I'm, I'm absorbing this so much hmm. coming off the golden rule. And then the line of questioning that you have, you're talking about considering others. Right, highly. The, like yeah. the, the, the crux of that. Yep. And with the spouse taking that time to consider and be thoughtful and understand that you don't have to voice everything. Do you think that a lot of the a big factor that goes into why people carry frustration? with them on a day-to-day -day basis, especially being short with others. And the closer we are, the shorter we tend to get with those. <laughs> I'll speak for me. Yeah, me too, bro. It's a human nature piece. There's a, yeah. of the comfortability. I think we can crap on each other a little bit more than we should. Yep. With that being said, I'm almost losing my train of thought because it's impacting me. It's marinating. It's permeating. Mm. <laughs> Doris, do you think that reacting toward people out of ego works against our own self and our intentions? Oh, yeah. 10 out of 10. Exactly. It works. The thing that we're doing naturally is shooting ourselves in the foot for the results that we actually do want. And then that perpetuates the frustration and the being short. Hmm. Yeah. The poet Robert Frost once said that home is the place where they have to take you in. I refer mm. to what you're describing here as delivering the mail to the wrong address. Okay. That, that mail should be delivered to, and, and I'm just going to use the home experience here. I should deliver that mail to my boss, you know, the Society for Human Resource Management, SHRM, tells us 57% of all people who leave a job do so because of a bad boss. And two-thirds of those who are remaining are considering leaving because of that same bad boss, right? So let's say I've got a bad boss and um, she who won't be pleased, he who won't be pleased, right? And I can't say to that boss for fear of my job because it's a negative work culture, toxic work culture. I call it a Kevin culture and I'm glad to <laughs> examine that with you too. Yeah. It's Kevin culture. You got Karen and then you got Kevin and we can talk about Kevin if you want to. So I come home and this dear spouse of mine, whom we've raised two daughters, we've got the, as you indicated in your intro, you obviously had read the news piece about our most beautiful, brilliant granddaughter ever born. We share her. So. I know honey is going to love me regardless because home is what the place where they have to take you in. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to, I'm going to deliver my mail to her address instead of the boss's address. Or if, if you want to think about it even more graphically, the garbage that's festered and accumulated within me since my boss dumped it on me, I bring it home and I put it on that doorstep. <laughs> It, it just, the, let me, that's the Kevin culture. Okay. So let me contrast that with what we do as culture architects and the kind of culture that we help people create. There's several things here. I'll just, I want to mention two. First of all, we create a culture of authenticity and transparency to where we. I was so 
think you were going to say that. <laughs> <laughs> well, dude, it's true. The authenticity was rolling like a ticker across my brain. Like, how yeah, where does this I come saw in? It. That's a, I saw it across your prefrontal cortex, though. Yours isn't quite Excellent. as big as mine, but you got a pretty good one coming up there, man. <laughs> <laughs> You're a great thinker, right? So it's a, it's a scary. Amen. That's what I said. <laughs> authenticity and transparency in a culture means that I want you to challenge me. I want you to challenge me. I want you to disagree with me. I want you to push on me. I want you to ask me why. It's like a three-year-old granddaughter. Her favorite question is why? Why, Pops? Why? And then we go through about six iterations of that. Okay, you don't quite have to go through six iterations of why with, with your leader. However, I want you to push back on me. I want you to feel free to disagree with me without fear of reprisal. Like yeah. it's an expected value around here that we can collaborate and share opposing viewpoints and come up with something that creates a competitive advantage for our company that's mm. greater than mm. any one of us. Because yes. dude, if it was about me, I don't need you. If we are in, if we're in agreement, some of us are unnecessary. Yep. About everything. So rather than expecting everybody just to live in this echo chamber of a team with me. I don't need that. I want authentic, transparent, let's struggle, let's wrestle with it. And that's where creativity and innovation comes from in a company is this, can I say iron sharpens iron kind of mentality or friends sharpening friends, right? We're working on each other and really moving forward together. So that authenticity and transparency is just really key. Now, authenticity and transparency creates the other dynamic, and that is belonging. Mm. I got to belong, man. I simply have to belong. And what does belonging mean? That means several things. First of all, back to authenticity and transparency, right? There's that. But in belonging, <clears throat> I want to feel like I matter. And more specifically, I want to feel like my work matters. Bob Johansson has written this really cool book. I'm talking to everybody about it on every podcast. A lot of things like it's called office shock, office <laughs> shock. Bob is a futurist and was working with the DOD in inventing the internet several years before you were born. He's just one of those guys. He's looked into this current work reality and he and I both think we're living in a miraculous time of redefining work. We're stoked. We're excited. And that's probably the jazz for me and being a culture architect, right? But belonging is when I am, there's an equity of exchange because I'm giving 70% of my waking hours to you, right? As my leader and as the company. So if I'm giving you seven out of 10 waking hours, right? That's huge. That's seven hours. I could be with my granddaughter. That's 70% of my waking time. If I'm giving you that much, there's got to be some equity of exchange for me. So what am I getting in return? What I want in return is I want to know my work matters. How does my work matter? I want those daily tasks that I'm doing to connect with something bigger than myself. And that bigger than myself, that alignment of purpose, man, when you're, when you see people in the flow and at peak performance, there's an alignment with the company purpose, right? Yeah. And so, I, I get excited about it because, hey, what I'm doing matters and it matters in this way. This company produces these products and these services, which solve people's problems in this way. Then I get stoked and I get jazzed. Mm. Do you think that someone can live their authentic self without that? Without, what was the word you used? The meaning and purpose without the belief that what they're doing matters, that it's meaningful. Do you think they can be authentic doing something they believe maybe is superficial or pointless? You ask me, it's can weird. they live? Can, can they, I think they can exist. And I think we've given a euphemism to the antithesis of what I just described. And that euphemism is quiet quitting which frankly, I don't think there's anything quiet about it at all. <laughs> I think no, that it pours out body language, right? Oh man. It look during the pandemic, 
antidepressant and anti-anxiety prescriptions were up 30%. And that's just during the first few years of the pandemic. And oh, by the way, that's continued now. So we're to answer your question, yeah, you can survive, but you're going to have to do it in a chemically induced state or a medicated state or something. Now, look, I'm not against medicine. If your body doesn't produce enough serotonin and dopamine, please get yourself today to someone who can help you find that antidepressant that works for you. If you, if your body produces anxiety, like mine used to hair, and it, then please get yourself some help for that. Not what I'm saying. I'm just saying because of the disengagement between my work and my daily task and what the company's doing. And because I wasn't belonging, that gap got wider than I could span. I think it was already wider than I could span. I just think the pandemic exacerbated it and just yeah. heightened the intensity of it. And so that's why the response was so many new prescriptions, but you've got to, I think if you want to be in business 10 years from now, your company <laughs> It's absolutely positively got to create that kind of work positive culture in which authenticity and transparency reign and therefore people belong. That's going to be a clip message to company leaders. <laughs> and man, well, oh man, that, oh yeah. Well, and if I can just carry that out a little bit more and, and give kudos to your audience, because I'm a boomer, right? And I have millennial daughters and, and friends with a ton of Z's. So we're looking at three generations at work at the same time, right? Kudos to the millennials and to the Z's for not putting up with the crap that my generation did at work. Mm. Okay. And I'm just keeping it real healed, brother. Yeah. I had to put, I've been called everything but my mother's son by leaders. And they didn't even know my mama, <laughs> but yep. I still had to came from that generation where I was told, put your head down, shut up, go to work, shake it off. Right. But the millennials and Z's you've seen the collateral damage. You are the collateral damage to what's happened to, to that in me. Right. My generation's yeah. got the highest divorce rate. My, my generation's got the highest alcoholism and drug addiction uh, rate of any previous generation. And we see what that's done. So kudos to you for not putting up with the crap that we did and for saying, my work's got to matter. I got to belong or I'm out of here. So keep self-selecting. Just be very candid and very sure about who you are. Yeah, that's a big one too. We don't want to open that can of worms today, but if, if you want to talk about helping people understand who they are, we're going to do a part two if you'll accept the request. Oh, yeah, that, man. That, that's huge. Self-identity is key. Yeah. Yep. There's a reason yep, there are eight, almost 8 billion different people on the, this planet. There's a reason for that. And I want mm -hmm. to celebrate that reason. Yeah, that's awesome. There's uh, the authenticity piece. Mm. I'm almost like, because I like to, uh, we're, we're more angled toward helping that individual find those places rather than we could give messages to, to key C-level executives all day about mm -hmm. how to lead the company better. You got to let them have room for authenticity, but then you're coming up against, you're, you're going to meet, there's resistance there, right? Because now you're talking about a philosophical approach that if it's opposed to theirs, well, that you're going to create resistance yeah, and yeah. wake there's up that Kevlar line. again. That's right, Kevlar, right? Yep, yep. exactly. And, and what we're seeing is that particularly, and I'm talking about my generation now, the Karen and Kevin generation, right? They're just selling their business. They're just for pennies on the dollar. I, I can't do it anymore. And so then what does the next season of their life look like? What are the assets that our society is losing because they're abdicating their role to pass on wisdom and to encourage the next generation. It, it's travesty. Yep. Yeah. It, it's with just a few key tweaks, we can create a work positive culture, but you got to yeah. set aside that ego and really seek to, uh huh. Yeah. Stop. Protecting you, you have like this force. I don't know uh -huh. if you got a camera over my shoulder. <laughs> like I just, I literally made sure I had the questions that a couple things that I want to ask you hey. right in front of my face. Hey, and I was going there. We, we cloned your phone, man. <laughs>
Here it is right here. <laughs> yeah, Jason Bourne, you got a copy of my phone on yours already. Uh, so one thing I was interested in that caught my attention when I was re reviewing some of the specialties that you work, help teams work through. Sure. And because I lost it, it said it was one of the, what are the two words? What was it? I mentioned it to you earlier. What were the two words? What are two words that reverse the polarity of any negative conversation? So oh, it's something that I find interesting. It's definitely ego related because you have to be willing, whatever this is going to create a more positive energy. And so because of that, it's going to require the person to not be negative and reaction based in the ego. So this sounds like a very practical tip. I love giving practical tips to my audience. And this yep. is something they could, they could take right now, even if they're listening on lunch break, they could yep. go in and use these words, the next conflict issue, whatever. So take that and run with it. Oh man, thank you so much for asking. Let me give you a little bit of background on this because we teach tactics, specific yeah. tactics that you can start doing today. In fact, on my work positive podcast, I ask every single guest. And when you come on, I'll be asking you, Hey, Adam Kasich, what's one thing work positive nation can do today to start creating a work positive culture. Just one thing. B hags are nice, right? The big hairy audacious goals that Jim Collins wrote about love Jim Collins. He sold a bazillion more books than I have so far. Bless him. Yeah. <laughs> that's Bless him, right. Give me some. Bless him. Give me some. Yeah, that's <laughs> right. But how many bee haggers are there in the world? How many bee haggers are really need out there? But we need what I call daughters, D O T, do one thing, right? We just need more daughters. We need people doing one thing. So let me give you a little bit of background, then I'll give you those two words and that one thing that you can do today to reverse polarity of conversations from negative to positive. Everybody's been in a negative conversation at work. I don't know why our brains are this way, Adam, but man, our, once somebody starts complaining, it's like a pile on, it's a dog pile, right? Yep. You're just, everybody's going there. You start talking about the boss, right? Yeah, I know. And let me tell you what he said to me. It's, it's terrible. Right. And I want you to be honest with yourself. Now, if you're listening, have you ever walked away from one of those conversations and gone, man, that was a great conversation. I'm so glad I had that conversation about what a terrible boss we have. I just, man, I, I'm ready to get back to work now. No, no you walk away I... going like this saying, I need a shower. <laughs> yeah. Or you want to take a knife and scrape your tongue, right? <laughs> to get the words off that you just said. It's terrible, man. It sucks. It's, I call it the working dead movement, right? It, it's just the working dead and, and you've been caressed by zombies, right? How does that work out for you? It's yeah, cold flesh, right? Okay. Instead of that, when you find yourself in negative conversations, now it used to be around the coffee pot or the water cooler. Now it's on Zoom or Teams, right? And before the boss shows up, everybody's, hey man, right? Or you're chatting with each other, right? You can send a message just to one person. Like, hey, did you see the way Joey parted his hair today? Oh wait, he doesn't have hair. <laughs> I mean, it's just that kind of negativity. So yeah. the first thing you want to do when you encounter one of these conversations is redirect it, redirect it. Let's say that the conversation is going in that direction and to redirect, you say, man, so we had the best weekend. We went sailing out on the lake and it was just gorgeous. The wind was blowing in the right direction. I, I didn't quite get sunburned, but I got enough sun and we were out in Tampa Bay. It, it was just great. I loved every second of it. So I redirect it. Now, yep. uh, Kevin is used to having his way with you. So Kevin's going to just ignore what you just said about the weekend, give you the eye, right? Dude, that's not negative about the boss. So he's going to go right back after it. So then when Kevin gets back with it, you second thing you want to do is reframe the conversation reframe the conversation. Kevin, yeah, Joey, he could use some growth as a boss. But the last time I checked, when I went to the bank, man, I had money in my account because Joey's giving me some money for my work. Don't be too hard on him. That's reframing. It's yes and. So the third thing you want to do, because Kevin, man, he will not die. I think of Kevin as an Eeyore vampire, by the way. And, and we can talk more about what you or vampires mean, but you can drive a stake in his heart. That's the only way to kill him. But if you drive one in his head, he's not going to go away. So the third thing, if redirecting and reframing don't work, hey, Adam, 
remove yourself from that conversation. Mute yourself so you don't know Kevin to shut up because that's not going to help. That's just like pouring gas on a fire, jet fuel on a fire. Kevin loves that. But just remove yourself. You know how we all wore masks every time we went out for a while? Put your mask on, man. Mute yourself. Cut your camera off. Turn your speakers off. Just watch until somebody comes on that's really going to offer something productive and start the meeting. Kevin is contagious, right? So there's the background. There's three tactics you can do when you encounter these negative conversations. Now, the two words to reverse the polarity, back to your question. A work positive culture operates like stand-up comedy. We say yes, and that's just the only rule for stand-up comedy. You say yes, and then you take it on to another direction, right? It's yes and, yes and, yes and. So we're constantly innovating. We're creating. I don't have to agree with everything you say. I can be authentic. Yes. And I bring another layer to it. To reverse the polarity of those conversations, you want to say yes, but. But gives you a mental, it's like a coming a hard right turn mentally. Every time you hear but, your brain goes, right? It stops you short right there. So yep. yes, yes, but. But turns those gives you an opportunity to change polarity on those conversations from negative to positive. But you see what I did there? I gave you the positive yes and first, right? And then you can use yes but to change the polarity. Yeah, it creates a reference point. That's great. There's an opportunity for transformation right there. Opportunity for transformation. When I'm looking at this and I did the the notes on the first, second, and third to reverse uh-huh. the negative conversation. I'm looking at that and I'm like, this reminds me about how many people experience friction and sticking point in their relationships because maybe they're not considering how much gossip is actually a negative conversation. And as I'm looking at redirect, reframe, or remove yourself, is when you said remove yourself, I had a mentor that taught me how to, if I couldn't reverse the, the, the conversation or help them even understand that this isn't healthy, then it's time to remove yourself because I'm not going to be a part of talking anything negatively shaded about somebody who's not present. And am I perfect at it? Nope. Cause I'm still human, <laughs> but I really try to use this as a pillar in my life to not be involved in gossip of any kind. Good for talked you. about you and you know me and you know of me and you, I've been tested and I've shown true over time. I want the people that know me the long haul to be like, if he spoke about me, it was positive. And if it was negative and you're telling me that he didn't say it. Good for I you, want man. that level of trust to my character. Yeah. I, this, these are, that's obviously an ideal. And I believe I do pretty good at it. When I gossip is when I'm probably with my wife in the kitchen. Who's just, geez. You know. <laughs> anyway, but not about the neighbors. <laughs> Never. <laughs> I'm human, man. So no, yeah, I did. And that's a huge thing because gossip, do you know of many other things that can, that can rip apart a culture quicker than gossip? Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, and for me, gossip and negative conversation are synonymous. That's it. Yep. Yep. Mm-hmm. Agreed. Yeah. Man. And uh, by the way, if you, until you remove yourself, you're complicit in the conspiracy to perpetuate that negative conversation. Amen. I agree. We have going back toward the beginning and, and some of these frameworks that you work with under perception uh-huh. or perceiving. That's a personal I, practice. Yep. I, I spend a good amount of time with clients about the construction of their perception that teaching people to think about what they think about, to think about their thoughts. That's right. And very few people do this. And I was shown this light to raise my awareness some time ago. And with that, you talk about how do we focus on the positive? That seems so simplistic to say, how do we focus on the positive? It's really important, but I think a lot of our conditioning, depending on where we come from, our perception is shaped by that conditioning, our upbringing, and the things that we've repeated over and over and over and over to where these things are automatic. Bob Proctor talked about 95% of everything we do, say, think, or feel by the time we're 35 is automatic. Yep. And that's Mm mind-blowing. And so with that automation in place, 
we have to start getting critical toward our own perception and think about what we're thinking about and not automatically trust it. <laughs> Are there ways and tactics that you have that create that positive culture so somebody can truly be who they are and mm. influence when it comes to how they can take ownership and responsibility for their own perceptions at work, ways to shift these things to think about, tactics to do, whatever they are. A sticky on the computer screen, remember to think about your thoughts. I don't know, but <laughs> what do you have for us on that? Perception yeah. is powerful. Oh, it really is. In fact, as I like to say, the work positive culture starts and stops in your head. That's the place, it, it's the playground, it's your sandbox. The cool thing is you have a choice. If you don't hear anything else I say today, hear this. You have a choice. You choose your thoughts. Now we're back to being a coach and asking powerful questions and helping a coach can help you do this or you as a coach can help someone else do this. Just to raise that level of awareness. Okay. What are some of the presuppositions behind what you just said? Where did you first hear that? Um, who told you that? That's one of my favorites. Who told you that? That's um, a great one. And there's so many people who talk about invisible scripts that we inherit from families of origin or from the first job we had. And so we think all the rest of the bosses are Kevin's, right? You can choose what you think and replace those thoughts. Now, whatever device it is that you want to do, whether it's a pink sticky note on your computer screen, whatever it is, focus on the positive at work. Sounds simple, but it ain't easy. Because you're pulled into conversations with Kevin's that are negative, because the environment around you supports negativity. If there was one thing I would encourage your listeners to do, Adam, and, and you want to light the match of the revolution freedom, right? If that's where you want to move, just do this one thing. Leave the TV remote control on the cabinet in the morning. Please avoid watching TV morning shows or TV news. They are in business to do one thing and that is to monetize negativity. And they don't care. And look, I was a news editor for a radio station for a number of years. They don't care what kind of day you have. They just want to hook you and they know that your brain marinating in negativity will hook you. And since you see what you look for, Adam, you're just going to continue to come back day after day. And their mantra is if it bleeds, it leads. The bloodier Oof. the better. The bloodier the better, man. You look at the first news piece in every single cycle, whether it's 20 or 30 minutes, it's the bloodiest. It's the worst. And oh, by the way, if something, you're in Tampa, if something terrible and bloody overnight didn't happen overnight in Tampa, let's just pretend that happens one night. They only import it from Philly or Chicago or New York or the Ukraine somewhere. Right. And they'll bring it right into your bedroom, your living room, and you are marinating your brain in that before you start work. So I don't care whether you're driving to an office or whether you're sitting down to get on Zoom in your office at home. By the time you get there, dude, you are crawling yep. with the world's burdens and weights on you. And there's not a thing you can do about any of them. You can't bring those four people who were shot to death back to life. And you can't do anything about it. But what you can do is you can choose not to abdicate, right? The editorial license, the filter on your brain to somebody in New York or LA who doesn't give two hoots about you. Mm. You can take it back. Yeah. Dr. Joey, how do I stay informed? We talk about the great media switch moving from push to pull media. Push media yeah. is the TV, the radio, and things like that. They're just pushing it on you, and you're willing, you're complicit in the conspiracy. You're letting your brain marinate in it, right? Pull media is, man, we've got so much great technology today. Your smartphone, your iPhone, you get to choose 
what articles you read. You get to choose how much of it you read. You get to choose what videos you watch, what clips you watch, right? You're listening to this podcast right now. You made a conscious choice to listen to Revolutionary Freedom, right? That was your choice. And there's some reason that you keep coming back to listen to this podcast, right? That's a choice that you made. That's poll media. You are in control. You can control. You are in control of the content you're consuming right at that point. Now, a word of caution. Be careful about an echo chamber. And in echo chambers, you're listening to things that reinforce your opinion over and over. Growth lies just beyond the edge of your comfort zone. So make sure you get a variety of perspectives and viewpoints. Don't fall into that unless it's revolutionary freedom. Don't fall into that trap of listening to the same thing over and over. Find some different voices to stimulate you and grow your awareness. However, just exercise that choice. That's your one thing that you can do. Avoid marinating your brain like a lemming in TV morning news. And instead, use the pull media to keep yourself abreast of what's going on. You will be amazed at how much better you feel when you start your work day. And your mental outlook is so much brighter. That it's so good because you're covering perce- you're you're going to shape your own perception on purpose. Then you're going to get into taking ownership, and accountability. That's going to give you more power. That's going to make you feel more positive and like you can actually influence some impact. Oh my gosh, push and pull. That's, that's a phenomenal tip. I appreciate your time, your wisdom, sir. Your sense of humor, your heart, your grace, it, your willingness. Th- this has been an ex- excellent experience. I'm looking forward right. to meeting with you, but. I am looking forward to absolutely, if I have you on for much more than a part two, you're going to start charging us to get consulting fees going on because you're just trying to give away all this stuff. Oh, wait a minute, wait a minute now. No, I'm not. No, I'm not. Hang on, Adam, because I come, <laughs> no. from, an ab- I come from an abundance mentality, right? Yep. And so yep. my goal as a work positive architect is to give as much of this good stuff away as possible and just to be a conduit because the more I give away, the more I receive. So, man, I'm so humbled by the opportunity you share in your audience with me. I'm just really humbled. Thank you so much for this gift of this opportunity. Hey, Amen. My pleasure. Dr. Joey, where can people find you? How do you want them to engage with you? And if they're wanting maybe even another thing, we'll put all this in the show notes later. I, I do have your bio information sure. from Adrian, but looking at that, it's looking at that. So where can people find you on that individual basis? And if there's some listeners out there that are wanting to bring you in to, for some potential coaching, because maybe their executives need some help and, and different things, and sure. how can sure. all that happen? Yeah. Hey, man, thanks for asking. Go to workpositive.today, workpositive.today, right? Because that's what we want you to do. We want you to work positive today. So when you go there, you'll see a couple of things. Here's one. I want to give you something. We're talking about those negative conversations at work and words matter. They reveal how we regard each other, how we regard our work. What's our culture like here? Obviously I'm on a mission. I want to give people something to talk about that's positive. There's a free course called something to talk about. And if you'll just, when you go to workpositive.today, just scroll down to the bottom of that page. Give me, just put your name. You can put Adam Kasich's in there if you want to, but give an email address that we can use, right? So we can, <laughs> don't give Adam's email address, but put well, your you know, but only one of you is going to work for, it's only going to work for one of you at one time. That's, so. it, that's <laughs> it. There's one Adam Kasich's set, right? Put your yeah. email address in there. I promise we won't spam you. We will only help you because again, we come from abundance. This is scarcity. It's a free course. There's six modules there. It, it will help you transform your conversations. Again, that polarity from negative conversations to positive conversations. The other way is however you listen to this podcast, you can pick up our work positive podcast, wherever fine podcasts are heard. And then, man, I have just become so overwrought with how many dissatisfied, disengaged people there are in the world right now. In America alone, Gallup found recently in a poll that 85% of American workers are disengaged. That's a travesty, man. All that humanity being wasted, all those people being trashed. So what I did was my Work Positive and Negative World Team Edition book that we were talking about earlier, you can get it for 99 cents. Amazon, Barnes & Noble, wherever you get digital copies of your book, it's only 99 cents. I I dropped my pants all the way to 99 cents, right? Simply because I want you to to read the stories that are in there. It's story-based. It's not your typical business book, okay? So you're going to love it because it's filled with stories 
and it will help you perceive, conceive, believe, achieve, and receive the work positive work and culture and life that you deserve. So just wherever fine books are sold, go get yourself a copy of that. These, <clears throat> this has been an incredibly valuable time that if, if people would study this episode a handful of times, listen to it mm -hmm. on their commute multiple times. I, I've heard you listen to one thing once, you hear something once, you retain, I don't know if these numbers are totally accurate, but 8% of whatever you're hearing, you're retaining. It's a low number. And, and it, it takes an average of like over, it's seven to 12 times before even something starts think, sinking in. Those are good sales numbers too, to close deals, seven to 10 right. touches before you a purchase. Right. Right. So good, listen, good marketing number. my fellow revolutionaries, it's, you got to listen to this one over and over again, because if you're dissatisfied at work and you don't hate your life at work, this can make work better. It can help you work positive today as I glance mm. at your mic flag, because it's an amazing concept and business and offering and value. So guys, <laughs> listen to this stuff. There, there's really stuff in here to help the individual who has power to yes. begin moving the culture. Mm. Yep. So thank you very much for your time, Dr. Joey. And uh, we will talk again very soon. I look forward to it, man. Thanks for having me on, Adam. My pleasure, brother. Thank you. We'll see ya. Thanks for listening to The Leading Show on helping family-driven professionals end discontentment, live their authenticity, and experience revolutionary freedom. I hope you're stronger for having invested your time with us today. If our content has impacted you in a meaningful way, please share this episode with someone you know. Also, and critically important, please leave a review and let us know. That way you can help someone you've likely never met experience the impact you have. If you're looking for more resources to help you grow and get unstuck, be sure to check out revolutionaryfreedom.com and apply for a free strategy call with me. This is a no pressure introductory coaching call where you help me understand what's holding you back. I'll give you the best feedback I possibly can. Plus, we'll get to know each other a little bit and see if there's a fit. You can also download a free overview of the seven pillars of revolutionary freedom by entering your email for an instant download. And if you have any questions or comments, we'd love to hear from you. Email me at adam at adamkasics.com and I will reply personally. Remember, the key to ending discontentment and experiencing revolutionary freedom is raising your awareness to that which has you stuck. If you already knew how to get unstuck, you'd already be where you want to be. Let us see if we can help you as I've helped hundreds of others. Take that first step right now. Request a free call. I'm here to guide you every step of the way. Thanks again for your trust, and I'll see you next time on the Revolutionary Freedom Podcast. That's sweet. It's great.